oh man this is what I call the temperature and little wonder down here we have the GSO going now I haven't been in here for some time I mean like months so I've got the juice note going, got some twigs and everything I put in there. I'm going to shut that down now, to be honest, I'm going to cook in here. The temperature, oh, <laughs> look at the baking temperature. That's ridiculous, it's, it's getting up to about 240 degrees. What a piece of equipment. Uh, lens is probably going to steam up. I'm going to show you what I believe is the best beginner's beach rig, but first, mayonnaise, a filthy fork on the floor. Some sweet and sour there. Some of these things, which we don't sell them, but they are the better quality ones. Frankfurters, the tin ones I've tried here, and they're not great. Grab a frying pan, cooking oil, and in there, butter. That can actually go on there, because I'm gonna do this first, guys. Last time I came in, I got it so hot, I actually caught the pan alight. It's quite entertaining. Uh, we can warm the bread up, the wife's coming in there to help me eat this. As you can see, for those who haven't been here before, this is the famous, the world famous Tackle Shack. It was Mike's Surf Shack. I don't come in here as much, generally in the winter, because it's got the log burner. And it's got all sorts of stuff in there, you know, it's bits and bobs and bits of old tackle and stuff. But it's a great place to come, all made from bits of pallet wood and old scrap wood. The whole thing was made out of engineering packing crates. The entire building, people. And of course, I've got quite a nice view out of the garden as well. It's lock solid out there, frozen solid. Hence the fact I'm in here. I hope this is hot enough to melt the butter. Yes, it is. You can see by how many clothes I'm wearing, it's freezing out there. <coughs> That's very hot already. So, guys, what we're going to do is crack on here. I'll show you this rig in a minute. I just want to show it in close-up. That's what I want to do. But first, I think the most priority, well, the priority is actually. Yeah, boy, that's hot. That's hot. Yes, it is indeed. That's the downside of this is you can't regulate the heat. Obviously, it's a fire. These are truly jumbo dogs. Big dogs. You can eat these raw, you can heat them up. Just as a tip, sometimes the that end is the hottest because that goes up the pipe. Not you can put the frying pan up there, but if you want to boost it, you can hold it. Just there, it gets very hot. So I try and keep it back here, see how, see how we go with it. When the temperature cranks up in here, a little bit of weak uh, winter sunshine. I'll probably be almost naked by the time we finish, especially with the cooking. I can't even put the hat on, it's so hot. And Mike's ordered me to get rid of the itchy beanie and he's getting me a trapper hat, which is the old one I used to wear all the time. I've got a croaky throat, that's very true. Yes, I've got the lurgy, got the bug. One of many through going around this winter. Um, normally you get a bad throat and it goes headaches, then you get a chest and whatever. Um, we just get on with it. I'm not going to sit inside laying around. I can lay around tonight, kind of, from the log burner. Mm. That's better. Got it off the granddaughter. Grampy, Grampy, <laughs> Grampy. <laughs> Love him, thank you. Two days later, loved him as well. You guys, you know what like. He's a goey. This is a way to do it, not outside freezing. Now I've had the ones in the tins, I've used them as fishing bait and I've obviously eaten them. They are not, not the same as those original Frankfurter ones. Yes, they're more expensive, but like a lot of things in life, you can actually get what you pay for. It's something to do with cooking, like outside on stoves or on open fires. And the hungrier you are, the better it tastes. Once it goes down a little bit, you've got to put some more water on. I've got kindling wood, I've got logs if I want a bun burn in here. But to be honest, I'm just loving this at the moment, just we like regular garden tweaks, you know, that I go around and pick up. And it picks up so quickly. Don't get me wrong, it is a wood eating machine. So 
can't say it doesn't burn, it's uh, I think that's enough. Better to keep it slow than the normal TA fishing way of burning. What I do just to heat the bread, I take one of the grills out and then I can just put the rolls in there, one for me, one for the wife, you're going to eat that. I just leave the door slightly open. If you do that, it doesn't affect down here at all. In fact, there, I'll give her, give her a call if you want to come down and eat this. Ah, oh, nearly done. Call the wife, she's going to come down. Yeah, the reason I thought I'll come in for Tackle Shack, it's just more fun for you. It. It's another of my many man caves. You've got the office, the old studio in there, got the old Tokyo Awesome Workshop to go around and bash up bits of part of wooden deck nails and things. And I can come in here because the sun goes around that way, it's very low in the winter, so. It sort of makes me feel better, even though it's minus five out there at the moment. It's probably about four now in the sun out. Um, I wanted to show you this rig. I've done really well with it. And I just thought, I don't really show it in sort of ultra close up. So I'm going to have some grub with the wife, and then um, she can do all the washing up and take all the dirty washing away. So I'll marry her when she comes down. And then um, I'll show you the rig in close up. I feel it's worth uh, having a look at. Mmm, that smells nice. Not burnt, is it? What do you think? No, perfection, yeah. So, before I start, I thought it's worth mentioning. Uh, I did a, I think it was a catfish film and a Xander film, and I just taped these battery lights. And somebody sent me a couple of battery lights for testing. Um, where you can unscrew the cap, push a battery contact to light it, screw the cap on. I thought, they're rod tip lights. Now I found them, I keep forgetting the names of, because you know I me, mean? I'm not commercial, I'm not flogging and stuff, I'm just trying to pass tips on for you guys. And indeed, they're called Rig Shark, or the guy that supplies them is called Rig Shark. It's called a tip light. I've shown them in here before, but not as a float. I'm, I'm using them as a float. For me, man, what a game changer. Catfish at night, I haven't tried them for carp, but you know, they might be a little boldy for carp. Um, Xander, it works. So they're called Rig Shark tip lights for the rod tips. I've seen them when I've been beach fishing as well now when I go down to the South Coast. I've seen loads of these little lights bobbing around, uh, but I don't use them for that because my rods are, are a painted with white emulsion, a bit of white or gloss, uh, and a bit of old uh, illumination reflective tape, whatever, from a yellow jacket, you know. Um, that's all I use, that's it, and put the torch on it every now and then, and occasionally I'll catch a fish or two. Sometimes, beach fishing, oh dear. So, rig lights, that's that. Now the other thing is, the sun's not in the greatest place, maybe I'll, maybe I'll move it to here, that table. When it goes around in the wind, it's really low, it cuts right through and it goes pretty glary. Let me move the table, table around here and I'll show you this um, other couple of tips I've got. I'll tell you what, I'll be quite happy with this temperature in here until about April. I could hibernate in here. I tell you where you can live in here. I've got power supply there, electric light, electric plug, free energy in bits of wood for a log burner. I could do baking, I can boil water. This thing even comes with a clothes dryer. I don't know whether Mike's got that. I don't think we've filmed that yet, but it comes with a sort of clothes drying thing. It's big, it's heavy, it's a proper full on uh, stove, that's why it's in here. You could probably put it, I don't know, you could take it in the car or something like that, but I've got it as a permanent structure. Now, these leads, they've got little veins at the back of them and they get twisted. As you wind in, let me bring the camera closer. As you wind these in, I'll put this here to give me a guide for, um, I'm not advertising it, Tasca or whatever it is, Alavasca, or sorry, alcoholic of some description. They've got these veins on the back, which I suppose are stabilizers in the flight. Fine, that's okay, it's a regular grip where I, I make these myself. But when you wind in fast and it comes through and it bangs over, say, rocks and big stones, it tends to do that. Can you see that? It just, if I put it that way, you might be able to see how they bend. One goes one way, one goes the other. So when you cast next time, I feel it's going to make that helicopter effect. It might kill your distance a bit. So you can generally, like, I can almost bend these in my hands, or you get a pair of pliers, or listen, this way, I could probably just. Oh, there you go. Of course, I don't recommend taking unnecessarily a hammer with you and a vice, but I'm just saying everybody normally has got a pair of pliers.
just bend those straight for the next cast. Now the other thing, for some reason, I've had a few of these leads like this where I drilled manual holes in them. They got little slots there which take this um, nylon sleeve to lock in position the grip while I do it like this. Now, just like this. But there's no slots there. They're just incorrectly placed by moi. So what I need to do, because they don't pinch enough, they come out too easily, is mark sort of, well not mark, just guess roughly in line with that piece of wire and then, use a hammer again, get a hammer, it'll be difficult to do because I normally do this in a vice, and just bash along, along, and get a hammer, I mean I can't do it without a vice obviously really, uh, and just bash another groove in here along there. Journey to show you, obviously, I would do it in the uh, confines of a vice in the workshop. But sometimes, again, these get burred over rough, rough ground, rocky ground, and I can just open a little slot there. Now, that wire, bend that around more like that, when that comes round, <coughs> so sick of this bug. Now with that slot cut there, as this comes round, this nylon, make sure you push it down, like that. Oh, it's a bit tighter there now. There you go, look, locates in the slot there. It should be here, but I'm guessing I've made this incorrectly. So if you do get that, or if you want to make your own leads, same thing. Drill your holes through there, the wires need to be spaced apart so they don't touch each other, going this way and that way two separate drills, keep the drill on a low speed, otherwise the speed of the drill will melt the lead and it jams up and sticks. So that one there, as you can see, I've got the same problem. Used to it years ago, it's handy if you've got a mould that uh, hasn't got that. So I've now put better indentation down there and because that's obviously a bit shallower now, just fold the wires around like this, squeeze them together, you can even overlap them like that to give more tension to your grip lead or less should you so require that, I've made that really tight make sure the little sleeves are down near the base where it comes out of the lead there and now those will lock, can you see that now, hopefully you can see it, there's a I'm in the sh, let's move this around I've got the dreaded sun again you can see there I've got a groove, so when I fold it around like this, it now locks into the two groups. They are much better, much better. So that now, pull back, gives me a really good, rigid, tight grip, and yet still when I pull in, trips out like that. Just a tip, so straighten the veins on these uh, ones that do have veins, if you find over rough ground that they have bent, and then Make sure your channels that locate these little nylon bits in there, your grips as it were, pinch your wires close together. There we go, that's dropped in lovely. That one is ready to be cast to the horizon and probably catch nothing again. Right, let's check this rig out. I'm going to try and get this camera in close enough. So the whole rig, let me show you. The lead goes on here, let's put a lead on so it gives you an idea, look. There's the lead, it just clips on, Bosch. You don't have to use the word Bosch, that's sort of optional. You can go click if you want. I don't know, I still retain a sense of humour the way the world is. You've got to have it there. There is the lead for the rig, that is not even three feet. It's about, from the lead, I bet that's barely 24 inches. Can you see how the one, two, three hooks hang off? Now I'll take you in close up here if I can with this camera and show you because there's a lot of smell close in there as you can see when it goes on the, on the seabed like that you've got three options I feel the bait gives off a lot of scent with this and I do okay and I think beginners would do okay with this rig we just, I just call it the Whack and Oster I think that's what it's called <coughs> you know when you can uh, buy them in packets right let's have a look at this in close up so there's your leg clip Okay, then I come up the rig. The rig body is this thick stuff. 
the trace itself hook or snoot goes on here but I'm going to try and see how close I can get in with this for you can you see there's two crimps either side here of a bead and a swivel but it's a special swivel because it's got that little link on it can you see that there we'll come back to that in a minute you come down the trace there's another crimp which is lightly crimped on that will slides up and down. You come down towards the hook. We come down the trace. Two. Luminous bead, black bead, luminous bead, black bead, a sequin which stops the worm going up and probably a piece of dead ragworm or seaweed. There's the hook. It's a, I think, 2-0. But if you look, it's just slightly offset there. Can you see that offset? Now if you have a straight bend hook, you can do that as well, you can just put a little tweak in it like that because that's really good for fish snagging themselves. If you like, they just pull, and that they nearly always get hooked. You know, even if you you don't always have to strike them. The same down here, all the way down. These are the worm stops. Third hook all the way down, and then up here. And I'm not going to say I know what this spring is for there because I don't. I don't know what that's for. That piece of spring. Somebody will have to tell me. I guess it puts tension on this top hook clipping in there. So these hooks all come down. Let me just let me just set the tripod up and uh, I can do it. It's, it's something I can't do one-handed. It's also quite tricky to film here. It's right on the other side of the table. Okay. Just so you know, there's the lead. Now you can leave this one loose, or if you've got a bait clip on your lead here. You can clip it on there. This particular link doesn't have a bait clip. You can clip it down. But this one, let's go for the top one, for instance, there. That goes down. And just imagine the worm's on there. It rests in there, just like that. Hopefully you can see that. I'll just turn it a bit. The next one, it's hard to do keep without keeping it tight on a rod. The next one goes into, yes, that little gizmo bit there and this one can either go into your bait on your lead there or you can leave it free swinging I just leave it free swinging I don't even clip this down when I cast it to be honest so you can see the principle of it it's hooked there that's how you would cast it so as I say I don't have the bait holding clip on the lead some leads come with it so let's assume it's there you put this bend of the hook into your lead clip if you like the others are already there, you can see it's a really, really streamlined rig. It goes whizzing out, and when it hit, hits the water, the impact of the water, those little clips disengage, bang, and all three nearly always fall free. And I think that's good for beginner. Finally, they've got worm stops on them. Because when you cast out, obviously that velocity through the air, maybe on a windy day as well, can slide the worm right up over the eye of the hook, up the line, the fish takes it and you don't know that the hook is nowhere near the bait. So, I believe that's a matchmas technique standard, they put a stop on there to keep the worm down on the hook. I'll show you what I mean. So the worm stop there, imagine the worm is on the hook here, okay? Worm's on the hook. You thread it up, up, up here, over the eye, pop it over the eye of the hook, but you don't want it blasting right up here. So you slide down the sequin here, goes on to say the head of the worm, then the beads, the little luminous beads, go on there, and then this is just lightly gripped on there, that crimp, so I can slide that, look, just slides down. Can you see it? Look, imagine, imagine the end of the worm is where my finger is, I can slide that right down, stop, there. So the worm cannot get blasted back up here, away from the point of the hook here. So that's a good tip for you guys. If you ask me what the best rig is, I'm saying for beginners this possibly might be the best rig. What are the two most important points? I honestly feel two most important points are on the rig body, and I used to tie plenty of blood loops, is to have the line going through the eyes of a, of a swivel, so your link off here can move all around the main rig body, it tangles a lot less. That and the fat, use a smaller sharp hook, like I showed you, say a small 2-0, but just tweak it slightly offset, and that other two, well, those are the two points I think might help you as a beginner, or a novice, or a newcomer, or indeed some super expert, go, mm, actually there's a couple of good tips in there, I'll try them next time I go out. 
Where would I be going now? Not for some time. It's still frozen. But wait for this. Something else I've been meaning to do is <clears throat> on here. This is an old one, and it's a wood backing here. A very, very fine mahogany veneer. I want to try and stick it back. And also, the writing there was handwritten by uh, a school teacher, an art teacher. His name was Guy Minter. He used to do a lot of my old fish cases and stuff like that. So that's not ju just stuck on there. That is handwritten. It's immaculate. So I want to try and preserve that. So this is one to try and hopefully pin back down because it could be a piece of paper, like that old one over the tiger shark, but this one's a bit better. I've got some... Uh... Well, it's mics actually, but it's on sort of permanent loan. I'm wondering if a bit of Gorilla Glue, <clears throat> excuse me, might do it, but it does sort of expand as well. So let's try it under there first. And I can clean out with a tissue paper. That might, that. I say, it's just a, a personal thing because it's, I feel, as it's been hand hand done, I feel obliged to <clears throat> try and preserve it because there won't be another one coming through. And certainly, I don't imagine anybody's going to want to paint that on a fine piece of veneer mahogany like that. Well, it might look a bit strange, but it's going to hopefully set in the right position. Unfortunately, the wife's seen the glue out and now she wants a job done herself. Not quite as exciting as Mako Shark Jaws. Now, can you repair the blue broom handle? Yes, I can. Good old Gorilla Glue. In we go. This stuff expands as well. So. And obviously I'm not going to leave broom on a table because as you all know, a brush on a table is very bad luck. Who else knows that one? Don't put a brush or shoes on the table. Well, you guys probably think it's not cold. Look at that sunset. It makes you want to go fishing. Well, sort of. It is solid. But I made a big mistake, big mistake. I forgot to decommission the fountain. And that could be a very expensive cracking thing. I'm kind of curious. I've had a bash there, it didn't break. So I don't know if I can get through there. I'm sort of stuffed. I don't know how deep it is. Can you guys open half in? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a lot of ice. What if we go through the bottom of the fountain? There's the water. Oh my god. That is really deep. This one I can almost see the reflection through there. How deep is that? Look at it. <laughs> that is there. Good God, that's four inches thick there, and I still can't get through it. What to do? There's nothing much I can do with that except cover it over. A bit like shutting the door after the horse is bolted. I'm still looking at that sunshine. Look at it just disappearing through the trees. Ah, oh dear. If I can get through this man flu cold thing, I might sneak out for a few hours tomorrow if it's not too bad, but I fear it's going to lock down big time tonight. See if I've got a tarp all to go over this. I mean, you people out there, you know I absolutely hate the cold. But sooner or later, that weather must get better. And then I'm going to be down there on the beach, throwing that beach re out there, because I've got faith in it. I suggest if you're a beginner, 
you do it too. Don't forget, hit the subscribe button, TA Fishing, TA Outdoors. Hopefully, we'll have another film up for you shortly.